One of the most thoroughly investigated cases in Dr. Haynes' file involves the near collision of a UFO with a United States Army helicopter piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Coyne and his crew. While flying over Mansfield, Ohio, at 11 p.m. on October 18, 1973, they observed a bright red object which paralleled their craft and then rapidly moved toward them on a collision course. I looked out the window and observed this light moving at a very excessive speed, in excess of 600 knots. Coming at the helicopter, it looked like a locked-on missile. A family of five in a car observed the strange red object on a collision course with Colonel Coyne's helicopter. They pulled off the road to watch. The thing that makes this particular evening a unique experience was that it was almost a mid-air collision with an object that we, or you know, as a UFO. We did not know it was such until it was on top of the helicopter, and that took just a matter of minutes. Colonel Coyne put the helicopter into a dive to try to avoid impact. When he and his crew looked up, the object was keeping pace with them. While it was in this position, uh, the green light came out from the undercarriage of the UFO. Colonel Coyne cut the power and set the controls for a steep dive. In spite of this, the helicopter was pulled upward toward the UFO from an altitude of 1,700 feet to an altitude of above 3,700 feet. The object that I viewed that particular evening... Uh, had a high degree of technology, it was composed of a structure and a design that we do not have. The object can move through the atmosphere without causing any turbulence. It can move at high speeds, below 10,000 feet. There are no vertical or horizontal stabilizers, no landing gear, no source of propulsion reflected on the craft. It looks like it, it, it could go fly in space. This document is the result of years of investigation into Lieutenant Colonel Coyne's helicopter encounter with a UFO. It verifies the facts just presented to you. Lieutenant Colonel Coyne felt so strongly about his UFO experience that he became part of a delegation to the United Nations that tried to encourage the UN to deal with the subject of UFOs. Among the many reports of UFOs in late 1973, one incident would stand out because of the credibility of the four witnesses. This is Major Coyne, Army helicopter pilot, his co-pilot, Lieutenant Arrigo Jetsi, Air Medic Sergeant Healy, and Robert Janicek. These men had just finished their annual flight physical early that day and were found fit and sound of mind. They would take off from Port Columbus Airport about 10.30 p.m. But what was about to follow and the subsequent report they filed would put to the test the credibility of these men. Approximately eight miles east of Mansfield, our uh, crew chief, Sergeant Robert Janicek, observed a red light on the east horizon. Our did you gentlemen see the same red light? Yes, I did. Our helicopter was flying on a northerly heading. We were flying at an altitude of 2,500 feet. Uh, he indicated that the light seemed to be pacing the helicopter, moving along in a parallel direction with our aircraft. Which direction from the helicopter was he at? Uh, moving, it was, it was to our right. To the, right side of the helicopter, and it was moving with us as we were heading north towards Cleveland. And at this time, uh, he indicated that the light changed its direction was coming directly at the helicopter at the same altitude. And as the helicopter uh, was maintaining a speed of 90 knots, the object came at a terrific speed from the horizon we estimated 15 miles. Visibility was reported 15 miles that night. Did you gentlemen see the object at this time, after it had been pointed out by the uh, sergeant? No, not at that time. I was flying left seat or co-pilot, and visibility from that seat from, from an object approaching from the right is rather limited. So I was having uh, a difficulty seeing the object. And it was that, for that reason that Major Coyne did take the aircraft or the controls from me. I grabbed the controls from Lieutenant Jutsey because I thought it was going to hit us. I braced for impact. With that, I pushed the collective down to get the helicopter to start to descend. I then looked at the altimeter. It was showing 1,700 feet. We were descending 1,000 feet a minute. The helicopter began to descend. And as this object came at the helicopter, it seemed to descend with the helicopter. When the helicopter went down, the object came down, but it still came directly at our broadside, as if to hit the helicopter from the right side. Did anyone else see the object at this time? Yes, I was watching it come on out of the east horizon. And uh, the only thing I felt was when uh, the skipper took over the controls, and we started to auto-rotate down, and I'd never been involved in a mid-air collision, so I was just watching this thing come at us. It was at this time I 
light came, swung 90 degrees from the UFO towards the helicopter. And it came in through the front of the plexiglass, and the entire cabin inside turned green from the light. It was a pyramid-shaped type of light that beamed down and came through the front of the helicopter. How long was your aircraft bathed in uh, this beam? The light uh, that came into the cockpit apparently lasted only for a few seconds, but it was enough time that I observed the red instrument panel lights utilized for night flying to be absorbed by the green light. Was it possible for you to determine the outline of this object against the star background? Yes, sir. It was a cigar-shaped object, like a symmetrical airfoil with the dome on it. It was a solid object. It was a metallic structure to it. And uh, you could see lights reflecting off the structure, because, and you could not see any of the stars or uh, behind the object itself. Well, while all this was going on, uh, what was the attitude of the helicopter? Apparently, when we were supposed to be descending at 2,000 feet a minute at 100 knots, we were climbing at 1,000 feet a minute with the control still established for a descent. And it, we went from 1,700 feet up to 3,500 feet and topped out at 3,800 feet. I would like to stress one important fact, and that is there is approximately 20 years of Army aviation experience between the four men on board the helicopter that night. We have been trained to follow procedures and regulations in reporting incidents, regardless of how they're accepted. And we tried to follow those procedures. And we reported the incident as it occurred and have avoided any speculation on the subject. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Virtually unknown by all but the most dedicated ufologists, a confirmed sighting in Mansfield, Ohio, may be the most significant UFO encounter to date. Why isn't Mansfield, Ohio in the pantheon of UFO hotspots? Because the key witnesses wouldn't, or were instructed not to, talk publicly. Until now. It was October 1973. A Cleveland, Ohio police detective asked his partner to meet him in an interrogation room. The cop wanted to make a report about the strangest thing that had ever happened to him, and he wanted it on tape. Today is October the 19th, uh, 1973, and the time is approximately 2 p.m. I have with me in my office at the present time Detective John Healy. Healy's going to describe in his own way uh, of an incident that had occurred last night. Okay, we, uh, we left... Port Columbus Airport at about 10.30 last night. About 11 o'clock, which is halfway... The tape you are listening to is an important historical document. It is a permanent record of a UFO encounter that occurred on the night of October 18, 1973, as witnessed by Detective John Healy. It had a steady red light on its nose. It was cigar-shaped, and it had a green light shining down out of the aft end. When Detective Healy wasn't on the beat, he was an Army Reserve medic. On the night in question, Healy and three other reservists were returning to Cleveland via helicopter from their annual Army physical. Over the town of Mansfield, Ohio, all four men made contact with a UFO. Detective Healy now speaks publicly about the incident for the first time in 20 years. We were almost involved in a mid-air collision with an object that was coming out of the east, heading west toward us. I noticed a red light on our port side going south. It was a big red light, but I didn't think anything of it. I thought it would be the, uh, the uh, port wing of another aircraft. We saw it uh, kept coming at us, and uh, it was a clear night, unlimited visibility. It didn't have any wings. It didn't have any, any windows, as you would see in a, in a, on a conventional aircraft. Healy was not the only witness. All four crew members saw the UFO, and the two pilots filed official military reports detailing their versions of the near-deadly UFO encounter. But Healy is the only one who, two decades later, is willing to speak out. He described for sightings what all four crew members attested to when they signed this affidavit. This was an object that moved at a very fast rate of speed. It saw us, probably, before we saw it. It just tracked us, because we had all our navigation lights on and running and blinking. <clears throat> and then it started back toward us again. Maybe it had never seen a helicopter at night. The UFO appeared to be threatening the helicopter, maneuvering toward it on a collision course. The pilot was flying in the right seat. He had to take the controls, and he put the uh, helicopter into a dive. 
After narrowly avoiding the mid-air crash, the pilot took evasive action, diving at a rate of 2,000 feet per minute. At 1,700 feet, the helicopter was suddenly paralyzed, even though the controls were still in a dive configuration. The UFO cast an ominous greenish light over the helicopter. This was just a humongous green light just shining down on us in a, a, very, a very definite cone shape. You could look at the light, and you could actually see the beam of the light. The pilot tried to dive, but instead started to rise. It seemed that the UFO was pulling the helicopter toward it, overriding the aircraft's controls. In regards to our aircraft climbing while it was in a dive configuration, I didn't feel us being pulled up as in an elevator or a roller coaster. You don't feel the G-force of a diver climb. I didn't feel that. It scanned us for that instant that it hesitated over us. It scanned us. Then it took off. After the object went off to the west, the helicopter uh, pilot noted that although he had been in a descent and his controls were in the configuration for a descent, the helicopter had actually risen to 3,800 feet. Jenny Zeidman was part of a research team from KUFOS, the Center for UFO Studies, that investigated the Mansfield encounter for more than three years. The interviews, military reports, and diagrams compiled by KUFOS make Mansfield one of the most well-documented UFO encounters ever. My analysis of this case showed that the object was under continual observation for five minutes, perhaps even more. Despite the impeccable credentials of the four military men, the Center for UFO Studies searched for ground eyewitnesses that could corroborate the sighting, and they found them. The DeLong family was driving on the outskirts of Mansfield when they saw a helicopter hovering in the wake of a UFO. The kids kept hollering, they wanted to stop, they wanted to stop. She finally stopped the car and I jumped out. I remember a, the whole top of the sky was lit up a dull fluorescent green. I looked out and the helicopter was just sitting there in midair with this object over it. And to be honest, it scared me. I was scared at that time. But I didn't, it didn't sink in and it was still really something, a UFO. The DeLongs were interviewed three years after the fact by Warren Nicholson, director of the Civil Commission on Aerial Phenomena. He grilled the family about what they had seen. I was a little bit doubtful at first that maybe they had just read the story in the newspaper, but they knew things that hadn't been in the article. From the multiple interviews we had with them, you could tell that they were scared. This brought together two groups of witnesses. It established the exact location of the event. We were able to uh, compute the flight path of the helicopter. Legendary UFO researcher Dr. J. Allen Hynek compiled sketches of the event drawn by the flight crew and conducted in-depth interviews about every aspect of the encounter. At the same time, the military was conducting their own investigation. They ruled the incident a near miss with an unidentified craft. Their findings were inconclusive in large part because the radio transmissions between the helicopter and the tower had mysteriously disappeared. Was the tape erased to cover up the encounter? Or could the UFO have intentionally obliterated the transmission? Coincidentally, many other onboard instruments continued to malfunction weeks, even years, after the incident. The aircraft number was a 15444. That was the aircraft we were in that uh, She was never any good after that. She was the hangar queen after that. They could, uh, the radios would never work right, uh, navigation instruments, nothing. The skeptics immediately came up with the idea that this was a meteor. Well, there's no way this could have been a meteor. It lasted for five minutes. No meteor takes five minutes to cross the sky from horizon to horizon. As far as I'm concerned, the case will not be concluded until we have identified this object. But after 21 years, the trail is growing cold. The Mansfield UFO will never be investigated by our military the way Detective Healy once took for granted that it would be. Quite something. Anything further comes along, I'd just be interested in knowing. Oh, well, we've got yeah. a reserve meeting on the 3rd of November, and if nothing else, I'll find out how far the report's gone from there. Okay. Thanks ever so much. <laughs>